Good evening. Welcome to the combined work session and regular virtual meeting for May 11, 2021. The first item on the work session agenda is the Pledge of Allegiance by the Stonehurst Hills Elementary School students. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Some very smart students there. The second item on the work session agenda is a presentation by the Stonehurst Hills Elementary School principal, Ms. Melissa Wallace on Stonehurst Strong. Good evening. Oh. There we go. Good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for the opportunity to join you here tonight. I'm really excited to share with you some positive trends in our PBIS data and some reasons why we are so Stonehurst Strong. So if you take a look at the graph up here, it gives you some data from the past three years regarding our risk ratio and our protection ratio. What the heck does that mean? <laughs> well, what it means in plain English is that in comparison to previous years, the risk to safety ratio is a lot closer than it was previously. In even simpler terms, while there may be a potential or folks feel there's a potential to be exposed to unsafe behaviors during the school day, our staff generally feel safe while they are in the school environment. However, it's not good enough. Our goal is to get the risk ratio below 50% and our protection ratio above 70%. And I do feel like we're well on our way. Oh, thank you. I went to college. <laughs> the SAS subscale is a comparison to our previous years. In general, our total percentages have varied within the past three years. Our school, as you probably already know, has been through a lot of transition. Our uh, percentages are trending upwards, but as I said, there's still much more work to put in place so that we can reach a goal of over 70% total implementation average of our PBIS program. We're doing a lot of great work with PBS, PBIS, and I am excited about the momentum that is already there, and I have a lot of energy to put behind the existing program. I'm so excited to see when students are able to safely return to school mm -hmm. in person, how they will grow and thrive with our existing and strengthened PBIS program. We know what our biggest area of concern is so that we can target it. Right now, it seems as though we need a clearer definition of problem behaviors with distinctions between office and classroom behaviors. So we're working on a flow chart, but the flow chart is something that I think anyone who has ever experienced the field of education and has had a flow chart put in front of them and said, okay, this is how you deal with behavior, right? We need to use that in addition to looking at each student holistically and considering the whole child, the whole situation, when we are dealing with quote unquote problem student behavior. The behavior always comes from somewhere. Did the kid not eat breakfast? It could be as simple as that. And our staff love our kids. So when you have a staff united in love for students and love for each other and love for the work that they do, you have a great formula for a wonderful PBIS program, and that is why I'm so excited. So speaking of my great staff at Stonehurst, I call this staff selections. My staff has um, generously donated <laughs> some quotes to this presentation, they were asked the question, what do you love about Stonehurst Hills? Um, so one thing that I hear a lot is about diversity in the Upper Darby, Upper Darby School District. And our teachers love the diverse student population. And the kids are really excited to see their teachers. And it, it shows. Even now during a pandemic when there's far fewer kids, I was in a classroom today <laughs> observing a lesson 
And the teacher asked the question, this was in second grade, the teacher asked the question, um, who is one of the most important people in your life? And this girl virtually raised her hand immediately, but the teacher called on her and she said, you are. And then my heart just melted. And the teacher said, well, that's really sweet, why? And she said, because you teach us and learning is the best thing you can do for somebody. And it was one of those moments, right, that, that you have every once in a while that reminds you why you do what you do. Um, another teacher said, I love Stonehurst because the group of people I work with, it, our staff is like, I can't even get my fingers close enough together to show you how tight they are. They have dealt with a lot of transition, as I mentioned, but they have come together to do good things for kids. What I love most about Stonehurst is the atmosphere of support and comfortability created by our strong group of professionals. Same thing. What I love best about Stonehurst is our enthusiasm for students. And it is true, our staff constantly goes above and beyond for students' benefit. And when I say staff, I don't just mean faculty. Today, my custodian, who has a good relationship with one of our younger kindergartners, took him in my office, sat in my chair, looked at the student, and had a conversation with him about why are you making these choices. Everybody is invested in our kids, and it is just one of the many reasons why this is such a great place to be, and why we are Stonehurst strong. What I love most about Stonehurst is the resilient and determined students I get to teach each and every year. The staff is pretty rad too. I said a lot about the staff, but if you think about last March and then this whole school year, and you wanna talk about resiliency, um, our students are a shining example of that. They are going through this really scary situation that we don't have any information on to help them feel more comfortable and they come to school every day. They get up, they put their clothes on, they tie their shoes, and they walk into the door of the school with a smile, and they put their best effort forward. And I think that's pretty rad. And the warm and supportive community of teachers and staff, um, I know this came up a lot, but I put this one in because this teacher said, this is only my second year here, but I already feel, feel part of the family. I've been at Stonehurst for not even a full month and a half and I feel welcomed as part of the family. I feel like I am more than willing to roll up my sleeves and get my hands dirty with this group of educators that truly loves their students and the work that they do every day. And so when asked what makes us Stonehurst strong, our staff said, being surrounded by professional, devoted educators who will stop at nothing when supporting the students and others. I'm talking about teachers who are like, this kid has not logged on for four days straight and no one will come pick up their materials. They live two blocks away. May I please leave and deliver these materials? Absolutely. Take someone with you for safety. I love your enthusiasm. Let's make it happen. Stop at nothing is absolutely the truth. We jump in to get the job done so we can best serve our kids every day. I get energy from the connections with kids, and the staff will always go above and beyond to provide the best education for our students. So that's what our staff loves and what our staff thinks makes us Stonehurst strong. Um, really quickly, before we get to the student answers, I wanna make sure that I highlight Zach Perry, Tristan Williams, and special guest, Ms. Callahan, because they are the ones that you saw do the Pledge of Allegiance. Um, they were more than willing to step up and they were a little shy, I don't know if you could tell, but I thought they did a fantastic job and their teacher was a great sport. But our students love Stonehurst because What I love about Stonehurst is all the teachers are great and the students work hard. I love Stoners because there's different work to do and I like doing work. I really like that they make us smart. What I love about Stoners is when the teachers teach me math. I like Stoners because I love art, because I learn new art. 
There's a picture right here of me drawing a new art. I love this place because of the kids. Best students in the whole world. Shout out to my third grade class. I love you. I like Stonehurst because I like the teachers. What I love about Stonehurst is that the teachers are nice and they treat people right. The teachers go out of their way to make everyone feel welcome and supportive. This is my first year and it's been so welcoming. It's the most amazing community. I love Stonehurst because ja Miss Jackson always gives me a prize. It's a very inviting place and everybody here supports one another. I love Stonehurst because of all the amazing faculty and staff and the special bond that I share with my kids. I like being able to have fun in Stonehurst. I love Stonehurst because you can go outside and play. Everyone that I've met here is incredible and so welcoming and so accepting and I'm so happy that I get to be a part of this place. I like Stonehurst because it's great. Go Stonehurst! by Beverly Hills Middle School principal, Dr. Brian Soon on student-created PBIS lessons and the U.S. Secretary of Education's visit. Thank you, Board President Brown. Good evening, school board, Dr. McGarry, administration, staff, students, and members of the community. I am Brian Yersoon, the principal of Beverly Hills Middle School, and I thank you for giving me the opportunity to highlight BHMS for you this evening. Our presentation features two components. The first item that we will present focuses on the United States Secretary of Education, Miguel Cardona's visit to Beverly Hills. During his time at BH, Secretary Cardona visited classrooms, participated in a roundtable discussion, and met with students. For our first video, we interviewed one of our seventh grade students, Sierra Brown, who met with Secretary Cardona. The second component of our presentation focuses on adding student voice into our PBIS lesson. Mrs. Shelley Haley, our PBIS co-chair, and seventh grade student, Tasnia Chowdhury, will provide us with insight behind this initiative. They will demonstrate a sample lesson and tell us, <clears throat> and tell us the next steps of how we are planning to get more students involved into our PBIS process. Please cue the video. Sierra Brown's interview. Hi, I'm Sierra Brown and I'm in seventh grade. We discussed how the pandemic had affected our learning, um, what problems that we've had personally being at home and ways that he could help to make sure that our in-person or virtual experience is as great as it can be. It actually felt really good to me, Secretary Cardona, because I felt like it's really important for us as the student body to be able to talk to people in power and people who really are in charge of our decisions. So, so it felt really good to be listened to and for our, and for our regards and concerns to be heard from someone like him. 
I would say that I definitely took away that he was really a genuine person who really actually did care. I know that a lot of times you may feel as if people in power or people who work closely in his positions like him aren't really aren't really for the good of the students because they are in power. But he but he was definitely really genuine in his intent to talk to the students. So I definitely took away that um definitely took away that people who are in power and people who are in positions like him do actually care about the students and and, and things that students can do. I really want people to know that he really isn't as, I mean, scary, quotation marks, as a guy as people might think he is. He's really, I mean, like I said, he's really a genuine and nice person. Who really, It really is out for the good of the students, so. I feel like it's really important that um, Secretary Cardona visited Upper Darby School District because we are a very large school district, and I know that people in BH alone have been really heavily impacted by virtual learning. So it just really meant a lot for him to be able to come down to Upper Darby and just really listen to our regards and concerns and just anything the students had to say and just our voice really being heard. It really made the I think five of us feel really validated and made, made us feel really heard. It's really important for us all to just make sure that we're being really truthful if we ever do get a chance to talk to him again and just make sure that we're always just being truthful when we talk to them and, and actually talking about the issues that we are facing and just and just rem just remembering that that he's a really nice person who really is out for the good of the students. All right, um, Sierra did a wonderful job. Uh, thank you, Sierra, for your. Your willingness to participate and your thoughtful insight it was really fantastic. Um, we appreciate you very, very much. Um, the next part of our presentation will be with our co-chair of our PBIS system at Beverly Hills Middle School, Mrs. Shelley Halley, along with one of our other seventh grade students, Tasnia Chowdhury. And they're going to talk about uh, something that we started this year, giving our students a voice into our PBIS lesson. Mrs. Halley and Tasnia, take it away. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for having us here. Um, hopefully, you can see Tasnia. She's in the meet with us. Um, and we wanted to talk a little bit and show you tonight about what we're trying to do to include more student voice in a more powerful and amplified way at Beverly Hills Middle School. Can advance <laughs> the slide. So what is, can you tell us a little bit about what the PBIS Student Voice Group and initiative so, is? So what is, can you tell us a little bit about what the PBIS Student Voice Group and initiative is? So I, I say there's two parts of this group. There's the one part at Beverly Hills, we have these weekly PBIS lessons that we have that the teachers teach us in class. It's like skills you'll actually need. Like, and you're actually, you're more likely to use these than the normal things you see. Mm -hmm. Like how to be a good person, basically. Um, and then the other part is, you know, making a safe place for everybody to be able to talk and discuss and learn and, you know, coordinate events and like strengthen themselves. Um, so we're trying to make an elective course here at BH on just like this whole safe place, kind of like speak up. There was some foreshadowing there, school board members on a <laughs> request coming your way in the not too distant future. Yeah, so you'll get more to that later. Um, so that was Tasmia. We did a little interview um, and where she was able to uh, help us express what we were looking forward to and the two parts of our student voice initiative. So the first piece is the PBIS lessons and we've already begun this. Um, I've been meeting with Tasmia and a group of about 10 or so uh, students who expressed interest and they are, they helped to create the lessons that we put out and are putting out for the month of May and June. Uh, May is typically the month where we do all um, cultural uh, awareness and diversity and multiculturalism and so we thought it was a really great place for the kids to have a, a say uh, since they are the culture that, of our school and so I just wanted to show you a couple of the slides that the students created that are in our lessons this month 
we'll go quickly. I know we don't have a lot of time. We don't actually need to watch the videos or anything, but just so we can see what the students created, that our student body um, in its entirety will be receiving this at end of June. This was made by Tasnia, um, and she felt it was very important to include the amazing poem by Amanda Gorman that was spoken at the president's inauguration. And so she created this beautiful lesson uh, using the video, and then we inserted the text of the poem to have the kids really look into it and find some meaning. We can advance the slide. I'm sorry, I don't have any control over it. Um, this is uh, starting to look into culture. So this week, um, for the lessons, we're really looking into what is culture and what, um, how we sometimes look at things differently from where we are, and we don't always have a full understanding of people who might be from somewhere else. You can advance. And this is something we've seen, this graphic, the cultural iceberg, where we talk about surface culture and deep culture. And we find that it's really important um, to not just teach kids about celebrations, holidays, foods, and dress, and music. That that is surface culture. And while it's a beautiful thing, and it's a way to help us connect, that, that culture of a person is so much deeper than that. And so this cultural iceberg is a really great way to show people what deep culture is. And we are also in this lesson giving kids a chance, and we don't need to show this, but that little create your own is a hyperlink to a Nearpod with a blank um, iceberg where they can fill in their own cultural iceberg using the draw tool in Nearpod um, to show the surface culture that people might easily see and the deeper culture, things that people might not see that they might want people to learn. You can advance. And this is another one created by Tasmania with children speaking about their own culture in their own words, which helps to show our kids how to do that. Finally, this is a fun one by um, Rishdania, another student who showed us um, how she wants to be able to teach kids to be able to de-stress. That she said, uh, us teachers are always teaching them to breathe and all these things. And as a yoga teacher, I'm trying not to be offended. <laughs> but she said, why not? Why can't we watch anime and listen to music that we like? That there's many, many ways to relax. So she gave the kid and teen perspective on ways to relax. And that was her contribution to the lesson. Yes, the anime and some lo-fi hip-hop music <laughs> It was is in uh, the piece in this. So we thought it was really great to have the kids' perspective on what they want to do to de-stress and relax. You can advance. <laughs> okay, so the next piece, and you can actually go right on to the, that next slide, is what we want to look for in our at, at, for long term. So getting the PBIS lesson student created. I have to say that was pretty easy. I gathered kids with the help of Tasmania. She got, got me a list of really amazing kids. And um, we've met a couple times. I gave them access to a, a Google slide deck and they just you know, put stuff in. And that was easy. What we really want to do is create a long-term lasting student voice that actually has power in our school and in our district. So what we're looking to do is to begin to write and create a student voice elective. We were really, really moved by the Speak Up event that we had earlier in the school year, and we wanted to use that as a spring off point. We didn't want it to just end there, so we thought that we would start working on creating this student voice elective that would give the kids a voice, have them create the PIS lessons as part of uh, pathways to have ongoing, meaningful, amplified, and lasting input in school systems. Um, we envision them being able to have a regular seat uh, with admin and at the table where choices are made and decisions are, are made. Um, we envision them being able to create within the, the classroom and then eventually school-wide a safe place for sharing um, timely and relevant topics either in our world, in our neighborhood, um, ways that we're feeling, topics that maybe a few years ago we were afraid to talk about with kids. Um, and then. Finally, we would like to broaden our scope and 
give the kids a chance to create a school-wide and a community outreach event in each semester that they participate in the class. And this would be something that they think is important, um, something that's timely, and something that we work together to put forth. And then finally, um, and I cannot take credit for this, um, this was an absolute school-wide achievement. We wanted to leave on a really, really high note. Um, we have achieved Fidelity at Beverly Hills Middle School um, at all three years, uh, one, year two, and year three. And we are really proud. Um, we are one of the very few middle schools in the state that's able to do this and accomplish this. And shout out to Jen Westrow because she is just um, amazing at keeping all the pieces together, all the moving parts. There's things she does. She's my partner. And there's stuff she does. I don't even know how she does it. Um, we we complement each other very well. And um, our whole school is really amazing working hard, um, especially our growth in Tier 2 and Tier 3 is really something to see. So I wanted to make sure we all had a nice congratulations for our entire school. Thank you very much, Mrs. Haley and Tasnia. Um, we really appreciate your contribution to what you <clears throat> what you both are doing. Thank you to Sierra Brown uh, for her willingness and insightful thoughts on uh, the secretary's visit. Uh, to the whole PBIS team for this achievement, as long as all the staff and students at Beverly Hills Middle School, this is a, a really um, total team effort. And Jason Taylor and Jeff and Westro for for putting a lot of this together. Um, and thank you all for giving us the opportunity to celebrate Beverly Hills Middle School today. Have a great night. Dr. Arson, thank you very much for a great presentation. Really appreciate that. During this unprecedented time, while social distancing requirements are in place, the Upper Darby School District needs to continue certain aspects of its business, which includes decisions concerning pandemic planning. For this reason, the Upper Darby School District will continue regularly scheduled school board meetings while pandemic-related restrictions imposed by Governor Wolf and any local authorities are still in place. It is the plan of the school board to hold these meetings with the minimum required departures from normal operating procedures. The Upper Darby School District School Board COVID-19 Special Operating Procedures document outlines expected departures from those normal operating procedures and the policy justifications for such departures. At the start of each board meeting held while pandemic related restrictions are in place, the board will review the departures from normal operating procedures as well as their justifications. While social distancing requirements are in place, the Upper Darby School District School Board finds it necessary to hold virtual school board meetings and school board committee meetings to complete required business. These virtual meetings will allow for public viewing and participation. Following practices already in place for regular meetings, all virtual school board meetings, in addition to allowing near real-time public viewing and participation, will be recorded and the recordings made available after the meeting. In order to hold virtual school board meetings, adjustments need to be made following existing board policy. These adjustments have been outlined in the Upper Darby School District School Board COVID-19 Special Operating Procedures. Dr. McGarry, can you talk about how the public can participate tonight's meeting, please? Thank you, sir. Sure, Board President Brown. Uh, the board is, is continuing to make every effort to engage with the public, uh, our teachers, and our administrators as we make decisions. Tonight will be no different. Members of the public can participate by either phoning in a comment at 610-789-7200, extension 2000. Please leave your name, your address, and the specific report you'd like to comment on this evening, and the board will take that into consideration before taking any action on each individual report. Your comment does have to come in prior to that re report so that the board can consider that before moving forward. You can also send an email to board meeting comments, board meeting comments at upperdarbysd.org. Same process as a phone call. Please provide your name, address, and the specific board report you'd like to comment on so the board can take that into consideration before taking any action on any report. We can provide an update as we move through the meeting this evening. We thank you for your participation here with us tonight. Board President Brown. Thank you, Dr. McGarry. Please repeat that or you know, intervene at your discretion to uh, make sure the public is well informed. The 
regular virtual meeting of the Upper Darby School District Board of School Directors will please come to order. There was a closed session on May 8, 2021 from 12.05 p.m. until 1 p.m. for personnel matters and this evening from 5.30 p.m. until 7.25 p.m. for matters to be discussed within the limitations for closed deliberations as prescribed by Pennsylvania Act 93 of 1998. For this evening's meeting, there were personnel and litigation matters. Roll call, Board Secretary, Mr. Rogers, please. Dr. Haig. I am present. Mr. Desnoyers. I am present and can hear the proceedings. Mr. Warsavage. I am present and can hear the proceedings. Mr. Neal. I am present and can hear the proceedings. Ms. Williams? Present. Mr. Fields? I am present and can hear the proceedings. Ms. Curry? Present. Ms. Mitchell? Present. Mr. Brown? Present. Thank you, sir. Policy 003 allows the board to suspend policies or parts of policies when appropriate. Therefore, due to the current ongoing crisis, I make the following motions to suspend language in two of the board's policies until the next regularly scheduled meeting. Policy 006.1, which regulates attendance at meetings via electronic communications. I move to suspend the language requiring board members to be present. Specifically, the language would be, a majority of board members shall be physically present at a board meeting when a board member attends through electronic communications. And policy 006, which governs other requirements of board meetings, I move the suspension of language requiring that those members of the public wishing to participate be present. Specifically, the language in the section titled public participation would remove the words that read present at a board meeting. Do I have a second? Second. Thank you. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed, please say aye opposed and state your name for the record. Does anyone abstain? If so, please say I abstain and state your name for the record. The motion carries. Okay, first, the minutes of the combined work session, regular meeting of April 13, 2021, and the special meeting of April 27, 2021, are in the hands of each board member and have been made available to the public. I move for their adoption. Second. Thank you very much. Are there any comments from the board? Hearing none, Ms. Buford, are there any comments from the public? There are no comments from the public. Thank you. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, please signify by saying aye opposed and state your name for the record. Those abstaining, please signify by saying aye abstain and state your name for the record. The motion carried. The report of the secretary, please, Ms. Williams. The report of the secretary is in the hands of each board member and has been made available to the public. I move for its adoption. Second. Thank you. Are there any comments from the board? Hearing none, Ms. Buford, are there any comments from the public? There are no comments from the public. Thank you. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, please signify by saying aye opposed and state your name for the record. Those abstaining, please signify by saying aye abstain and state your name for the record. The motion carries. The report of the treasurer, please, Mr. Neal. Thank you, President Brown. The report of the treasurer is in the hands of each board member and has been made available to the public. I move for its adoption. Second. Thank you. Are there any comments from the board? Hearing none, are there any comments from the public, Ms. Buford? There are no comments from the public. Thank you. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, please signify by saying aye opposed and state your name for the record. Those abstaining, those abstaining, please signify by saying aye abstain and state your name for the record. The motion carries. We will now have the report of the student representatives, Ume Sadiqwa and Curtis Everett, please. Good evening. We would first like to address the trial of Derek Chauvin. We are all aware of the tragic death of George Floyd that occurred during the summer and sparked many protests throughout the world. 
On April 20th, the country noticeably weird as they tried to convict George Floyd's murderer, Officer Derek Chauvin, was set to reach a verdict. The jury found Derek Chauvin guilty on all three counts, and the first step in accountability was taken. We as a district believe that change will occur, and this was a huge win for the country and a huge win for the faith in the justice system. We would now like to begin our student report. This past month, students, staff, and families of the Upper Darby School District continue making our district proud with their accomplishments. Academic instruction has continued to run smoothly, whether online or in person. Students are in person and can come to school each day while all safety protocols are in place and social distancing restrictions are followed. Athletes continue to enjoy their spring season with their team and theater performers continue rehearsing for their spring productions. All after school activities and extracurriculars were in full force and the students have been representing Upper Darby well. Upper Darby School District and Delaware County Memorial Hospital joined together to provide COVID-19 vaccination for students 15 years of age or older. The district is trying its best to provide opportunities for families so the students can return back to normal as safely as possible. On April 23rd, Upper Darby participated in the Day of Silence, which is a day designated to shed light on the injustices and wrongdoings that the members of the LGBTQ community have to deal with daily. For all members of our community who have faced hardship due to being part of the LGBTQ community, we are family and will always support one another. On April 24th, parents were encouraged to attend the Education Equity Funding Parent Summit hosted by a statewide cohort of organizations that are focused on helping to get additional state funding to schools that are giving fewer resources and funding. Peer funding is essential for our students to meet all of their social, emotional, and academic needs. This month, uh, the month of April was Arab American Heritage Month. We as a district recognize the great contribution of the Arab diaspora in our district and the diverse backgrounds of all Arab American families. This month we also celebrated Earth Day. Students and staff of Byron and Benko took the time to make our community more beautiful and develop safe and easy ways to ensure the longevity of this beautiful world. April was also Autism Acceptance and Awareness Month. The entire month we recognize students and loved ones within our community diagnosed with autism and resilience resilience these individuals show every day. On April 28th, Upper Darby High School hosted the April Showers Fundraiser, which raised money for unified sports and the Special Olympics. Students in the special education program at the high school all enjoyed a day of fun while honoring a great cause. Before we end our report, we'd like to extend our gratitude to our principal, nurses, administrative assistants, and teachers as we celebrated National School Principal Day, Nurses Appreciation Day, Administrative Assistance Day, and Teacher Appreciation Week in April and beginning of May. On behalf of the student body, thank you to the principals for taking care of the school and making sure students have the best possible opportunity to learn. Thank you to our nurses for safe and provide the care and support we need to be healthy. Thank you to our administrative assistants who work diligently to support all of us. Thank you, teachers, for engaging with students every day and teaching us academics, academics and preparing us for life. Also, I'd like to take the time to say Eid Mubarak to all the celebrating families. Uh, it's hard to believe the school year is coming to an end, but we look forward to continuing our duty. Thank you to the Upper Darby School Board and Administration for allowing us to provide the monthly report. Thank you very much, Kume and Curtis. You always give great reports, and we always look forward to hearing from you each month. Thank you very much. The budget of personnel and enrollment reports have been made available to the public, and the public uh, has been made available to the board of the public, and are reported as part of the record. No vote is required. We will now have the report of the superintendent, Dr. Dan McGavin. Good evening, Board President Brown, the Board of School Directors, Administrators, Teachers, Staff, Students, and Community Members who are joining us this evening. Thank you to our new Stonehurst Hills Elementary School Principal, Ms. Wallace, 
and the Stonehurst community for their presentation, Stonehurst Strong. I'd also like to recognize the outstanding work of Beverly Hills Middle School principal, Dr. Brian Yersone, and the Beverly Hills Middle School team for their celebration of the United States Secretary of Education's visit to our district. It goes without saying, I think we can see it each month, uh, Dr. Yersone and Beverly Hills, they do an outstanding job. But Dr. Yersone is really an exceptional leader. And did an outstanding job on short notice hosting Dr. Cardona on that visit that day. And it, and it took up a lot of his time but he turned it around very quickly for us. So I want to say to Brian, I know he, he went home to his family already, but to Brian, if you're listening in your car, thank you. Each month, I look at the work of this team, including the board of school directors, administrators, teachers, all of our staff, and I'm so appreciative of the wonderful events and activities that are happening in our schools, despite the challenges we faced during this pandemic. Board President Brown and members of the board of school directors, I have a few updates I would like to share with you this evening. The topics will include an update on our short-term goal and long-term goal of reopening schools for in-person instruction, vaccination of students ages 12 to 18, and updates from the most recent Chester County Department of Health guidance on health and safety plans for schools and districts. Before I go through those important updates, I would like to take a moment to recognize the outstanding athletic and academic achievements of our students and those teachers and families who are behind all of those students. Congratulations to the following students for their achievements in the Skills USA Pennsylvania State Competition in partnership with the Delaware County Technical School. Brandon Cologne, first place, category, this is pretty cool, t-shirt design, advertising design, and commercial art. Jonah Quillen, second place, category, related technical math, math welding. Skills USA is a partnership of students, teachers, and industry representatives working together to ensure this country has a skilled workforce. Skills USA provides educational programs, events, and competitions that support career and technical education in the classrooms throughout the country. Skills USA is recognized by the U.S. Department of Education and the U.S. Department of Labor as a successful model of employer-driven workforce development. The first place winners are eligible to compete at the National Skills USA competition. The competition will be uh, virtual this year. It would have been in Florida, so that would have been another conversation for a different night. But I do think it's also important that as I go through these un unbelievable achievements and later on tonight, you know, obviously part of the conversation we'll be discussing how the, the high school schedule and what we're working on, there'll be some conversations coming up about the high school schedule. I think we really have to take a focus on the pathways to graduation, and this is proof tonight. Our students have strengths and talents in various different ways. We really need to, to, to practice what we preach and provide those kids with the same opportunities as every other kid in this school district to be recognized, celebrated, and awarded the same for the achievements and the skills that they have with what they bring to the table. So as I move from forward with that, I'll, I'll go to the athletic field. The National Field Hockey Coaches Association's National Academic Squad Program, that's a mouthful, honors high school student athletes who have achieved a cumulative grade point average of 3.3 or higher through the first semester of the current academic year, and high school juniors and seniors who, achieved, who have achieved a cumulative grade point average of 3.5 or higher through the first semester of the current academic year. This year, we are so fortunate to congratulate the following members of the Upper Darby High School field hockey team in recognition of being named to the 2021 National Academic Squad. Megan Brown, Olivia Chamberlain, not that everybody on here is not important to me, but Olivia is the student who represented the student body. If you remember board members meeting Dr. Cardona, and she's a strong, strong voice for the high school in our monthly meetings. Olivia, congratulations. Harver Cower, Kimberly Liu, Grace Schiller, Kara Schiller, and Margaret Smith. Margaret Smith is the daughter of a former board member, Kate Smith. Congratulations to those student athletes. Our Delaware County Science Fair winners continued on the highly competitive Delaware Valley Science Fair. With close to 800 students entering from local fairs in southeastern PA, southern New Jersey, and all of Delaware, the fair is among the oldest and largest in the country. I have been informed that Upper Darby High School had one of our best years yet. Three of our students, Elise Olmsted, 
Nishat Taznin, and James Yoko came very close to coming to making it to the next level a trip to participate in the International Science Fair. Elise remotely used a telescope. And we, we have to slow down and get through this. This is pretty cool. Elise remotely used a telescope at the Green Bank Observatory in West Virginia to collect radio wave data from all around the Milky Way galaxy to determine the red shift and rotational speed of the galaxy. So I, I look this up. This is really taking almost prisms and light to measure distance. Um, that's about as far as I could get an understanding at that, at that point. It's, it's pretty cool. Um, this information was then used to predict the percentage of dark matter in our galaxy. Nishat and James use a geospatial information system to access the most recent and detailed images of Pluto from the New Horizons mission. They analyzed close to 200 craters on Pluto for shape and size, and compared that information to craters on other planets to predict the surface composition of Pluto. Again, congratulations to all of our students who are recognized at the Delaware Valley Science Fair. Elise Olmsted, first place in ninth grade Earth and Space Science category, the rotation curve of the Milky Way galaxy dark matter. Nishat Taznin, second place in teams category, using craters to predict surface composition of Pluto. James Yoko, second place in teams category, using craters to predict surface composition of Pluto. Aaliyah Sullivan, third place in ninth grade medicine and health, the effect of mask wearing on respiration. Aliana Swift, honorable mention in ninth grade behavioral sciences, do colors affect learning? Layla Hoke, honorable mention in ninth grade medicine and health, Correlations between age and coronavirus smell loss. Maggie Smith, honorable mention, 12th grade chemistry, making usable, digestible, biodegradable plastics. Luke Olmsted, American Meteorological Society Certificate of Outstanding Achievement for Creative Scientific Endeavor in the areas of atmospheric and related oceanic and hydrolo hydrologic sciences. Jabe Cox, ASM International Philadelphia Liberty Bell Chapter, and I believe that is for um, specific science medals, uh, Bell, uh, previously known as that, Bell Chapter Award, $200, an ASMN medallion for the best materials engineering project based on use of material related concepts, a demonstration of some aspect of the materials paradigm, and a quality presentation. So let's just, round of applause for those students. Unbelievable job. I also want to mention that this year we are celebrating 20, our 25-year partnership with Boeing Helicopter. Students in the Upper Darby High School Engineering Program completed three virtual workshops covering topics including fixed wing aerodynamics, rotocraft aerodynamics, electronics, and careers in engineering. The 12 students who participated were featured across our social media. I would like to thank Boeing for their continued support and sponsorship of this wonderful program, all the teachers, it's been such a time-honored program. It, it, I, we miss going down and seeing it in person, but it's great that they kept it going. It's great for our students. So congratulations uh, to our, that partnership and the students who participate and the teachers that are involved. Lastly, I want to congratulate student Ketsia Dennis and teacher Sasha Gallagher as Upper Darby School District's winners for this year's Making a Difference Award, sponsored by the Delaware County Intermediate Unit. This award honors students and adults in the community who are leveling the playing field for children with disabilities. The award more specifically recognized students who have presented and persevered and overcome challenges to be successful within an inclusive setting and who have demonstrated exceptional support, friendship, acceptance, and understanding to ensure the inclusion of all classmates of all abilities. The adult winners have demonstrated extraordinary efforts through their exceptional work to promote acceptance and understanding to ensure inclusion of all children of all, of all abilities. Ketsi and Ms. Gallagher will be recognized at the DCIU's virtual celebration ceremony on May 20th. We are so proud of them for their tremendous example in securing opportunities for students with disabilities to engage with and learn alongside their non-disabled peers in school and in community settings. And again, this is similar to the earlier presentations. 
Our goal, one of my goals as superintendent was to empower students and to have student voice. It's so great to see our students living this out. Curtis and you may, you've been doing it all year long. We thank you for your leadership. I now want to provide a brief, uh, as brief as I can, update on our short-term goal and long-term goal of reopening schools for in-person instruction, vaccination of students 12 to 18, and updates from the Chester County Department of Health on guidance on health and safety plans for schools and districts. Short-term plans to reopen schools for full days of in-person instruction. There are barriers to returning students to full days of instruction right now still. At this time, six feet of social distance while students are unmasked and eating during lunch continues to be a significant barrier to returning students for more in-person instruction. Now, what I'm about to say is not 100% definite at this time, but we are looking into potentials if this were to happen. There are reports that the rela there will be relaxed social distancing guidelines after June 1st in the cafeteria. If we receive updated guidance on this information that we will be able to go below six feet of social distance in our cafeterias, we will reconsider returning students for full in-person instruction this year. At this time, however, the six feet of social distancing in our cafeterias continues to be a barrier. We also continue to attempt to hire staff to support six feet of social distancing during lunch periods in the cafeteria and in classrooms. At this time, however, we have only received interest from 20 people who are willing to work to support our cafeteria and lunch needs. We have averaged, on top of needing that staff, we have also averaged 70 teachers a day calling out throughout the district. And the number increases on Fridays. The concern is we have fewer than 50% of teacher call out days that are filled with substitute teachers. And this requires other teachers to take on additional responsibilities. We continue to see a high number of class coverages and loss of preparation time for teachers. Again, so I'll go through some of the barriers still. Six feet of social distancing in the cafeteria, a lack of individuals in the community who are willing to work with us to provide the appropriate six feet of social distancing during lunchtime, and the number of teachers that are out or calling out and unfilled subs are barriers at this point in time to returning full in-person instruction. Contact tracing still remains and remains in the newest guidelines. Contact tracing will continue to be a requirement and becomes very difficult, nearly impossible to manage as a district or school moves below six feet. Nonetheless, we are planning on a full return for in-person instruction for all students as soon as possible. In my public meetings during home and school meetings and with parent groups that asked to reach out to speak with the administration and Mrs. Buford joins me in the, many of those meetings, I promised that I would make it clear. The school district believes that in-person instruction for students is still the best form of instruction for students. We believe our schools are safe. If we follow the protocols, returning to school for in-person instruction is safe. We also recognize that there are community members who believe that learning virtually is still the best option for them, and we will continue to provide that option to all of our students now and moving forward. Solution to returning to full days. Continue to inform the public and the community that schools are safe for in-person instruction. We believe they're safe. Continue to hire more staff to support and meet social distance requirements during lunch for a full return to in-person instruction for the current school year and 2020 and the 2021-22 school year. We have a goal of 90 staff to support our cafeterias and our K-8 program if six feet of social distancing in the cafeteria remains. If the social distancing requirement of six feet is removed by June 1st, this will allow us to return students to in-person instruction before the end of the school year. Again, there are still barriers. While this will most likely be 10 or fewer days of in-person instruction, we believe this sends a message about our desire to have our students in our schools as safely and as soon as possible. We are also uh, tonight moving forward potentially with purchasing additional resources such as desks to appropriately space students in classrooms and available spaces other than the cafeteria. For the 2021-2022 school year plan, kindergarten, elementary, middle, and high school, Half-day kindergarten program it will be in person five days a week. That is our plan for next year. Students who would like to continue with synchronous or asynchronous instruction will be able to do so. 
full days of in-person learning for elementary and middle school students. It is our belief that there is no replacement for in-person learning at the elementary level. While we plan to encourage our youngest learners to attend in person, students who wish to remain virtual will be able to do so. We will survey parents prior to the start of next school year for their instructional model next year. The high school schedule is still under review, but our plan will be to return students to in-person instruction five days a week. Upper Darby High School is currently open, as you heard in the student representative report tonight, to all students for in-person instruction. But we are currently not able to serve breakfast or lunch on campus because of the six feet of social distancing in the cafeteria. So again, I want to make it crystal clear tonight. We would like to have students in our schools. A quick summary. Six feet of social distancing is still a barrier in our cafeterias. We don't have enough staff willing to come in to be hired to operate and support classroom, cafeteria, and other spaces that we can make available to supervise lunches so they can come into school for a full day of instruction. Contact tracing will also be a concern. If the rumors are true, which we don't know if they are at this point in time, but if social distancing in the cafeteria is relaxed by June 1st, we will still face the issue of contact tracing. Every time schools go below six feet and contact tracing and quarantining is still in place, we do run the risk of returning students for in-person instruction with less than 10 days of school left and only to go back out to virtual learning. Nonetheless, I believe I have a responsibility to keep the promises we've discussed during this pandemic that we would adhere to and move our way through the guidance and recommendations that have been presented to me and that I present to this board and that we will make a safe, smart return to students to our buildings when the time is right. We do believe over this period of time that our schools are safe and we are encouraging students to return if their parents feel that they feel it's the right thing to do. Vaccinations. The district held a vaccination clinic for 16 to 18 year old students on May 5th with a second dose scheduled for May 26th. And this is an important concern to those who are listening tonight. We've all got to come together to recognize that there are several factors getting us back to what we call normal. Vaccinations, whether we like vaccinations or not, are a key ingredient to getting us to that next step. Unfortunately, we have over 2,500 eligible students and only 400 high school students, 16, 18, showed an interest. And on the day of the vaccination, fewer than 200 students were vaccinated on May the 5th. Now, my hope is that many of the students have already been vaccinated because it's accessible now. You can walk in, you can go to your local pharmacy. We will encourage you, please continue to get vaccinated. The second vaccination for students ages 16 to 18 will take place on May 26th. Any parents or family members or students that need help and need access or have questions or concerns about being vaccinated, feel free to reach out to any one of us in central administration. We'll make ourselves available for a conversation. The district has also gathered student and family interest for vaccinating 12 to 15 year old students. At this time, over 600 students have shown an interest. We will be sending out a link to have these students register. We'll be hosting a vaccination clinic for 12 to 15 year olds on May 26th. The same day we provide the second dose for our 16 to 18 year olds, we will vaccinate students ages 12 to 15 who have showed an interest. They have to have a parent with them from one to five o'clock here at the high school with a second dose on June 16th. I'd like to now just forward your attention to the screen. And Jay, is this available for the public to see? Ms. Buford, is the public seeing what's on this on the screen? Just a minute, it's a delay. Okay. Jason. Well, just a minute, Dr. McGarry is on our planning document. He's getting to it. Yeah, can you? I don't know if you could just turn the camera. It's, 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 it
So I'm going to be referring to a document uh, called the COVID-19 School Guidance updated on May 6, 2021 from the Chester County Health Department. You can access this publicly. We'll provide this link publicly as well. I'm only going to go through one of the key changes tonight. There are several minor changes listed in the, in the report. I provided those to the board as well. One of the key changes at this time is in reference to masking. And I just want to particularly pay attention to one of the key highlighted areas. We've already received a lot of questions about wearing a mask. Um, and it's important that I just point out that the Pennsylvania Secretary of Health updated the universal face requiring FAQ to require staff to wear face coverings at all times while well in school, even when six feet of social distancing can be achieved. There are some limitations. There's an FAQ that provides those limitations. The key aspect now is that any staff engaging in high exertion outdoor activities, including but not limited to athletics, exercise, or play activities, is not required to wear a mask when actively engaged in those activities. This also goes for students. Any student engaging in high exertion outdoor activities, including but not limited to athletics, exercise, or play activities, is not required to wear masks when actively engaged in those activities. Tonight under old business, there'll be some changes to our health and safety plan. We will be implementing some of these recommendations for our students while they're out at recess. We still encourage our students, if they're not running around or playing in recess, to keep a mask on. We'll still be requiring masking while in school, even if we, go below, if, if, even if we remain at six feet till the remainder of the year. But we are going to follow the guidance that for outdoor activities or high exertion activities, students will have a break and not have to wear their mask outdoors. Parents and students who feel more comfortable while outdoors keeping a mask on, we encourage them to do so. But we are making these changes in our health plan this evening that will be coming up under old business. I wanted to make sure that that was made public under my report this evening because I know there have been a lot of questions from members of the public. Also, there'll be an update coming out soon that um, because of some of these relaxations with guidelines, we will also allow uh, two tickets per student to our high school graduation. So we'll be allowing some uh, participants to come to our high school graduation, two tickets per family member, pending weather. If it does rain, we'll be moving indoors. We'll make that announcement in advance of the actual ceremonies. So Board President Brown, I'm sorry for the long report. I want to thank you the Board of School Directors, our staff, our students, and our families for their patience and engagement throughout this pandemic. I also want to be clear that I believe that there is no real replacement for in-person instruction for our students. But I recognize that some of our families and some of our students prefer virtual, synchronous, and asynchronous instruction. We will continue to do our best to support the needs of our entire community. Board President Brown, this concludes my report for this evening. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. McGarry, for that comprehensive report. And you never have to apologize for the length of this. Always very detailed. I have to commend you and your team for your performance throughout COVID. You seem to always have been kept us one step ahead of, of the game. So thank you for that. Thank you for your work. We will now have an update on the April 27, 2021 Education and Pupil Services Committee meeting. Mrs. Mitchell will read the summary. A detailed summary of the meeting, including public comments, can be found on board docs. Thank you, President Brown. Um, the Education and People Services Committee, as Mr. Brown said, met on April 27th at 6 p.m. All board members were present. We had four agenda items. The first one um, goes to closing the achievement gap related to COVID-19, and there were two items under that. Um, the first one was informational on our summer academy. I'm sure all parents have received the information at this point on what is available for the Summer Academy and links to register. The second item was foundations for grade one. Board action is required tonight. It is in the report. The th second item was IXL. Um, Mr. Robert Schwartz um, presented um, an, an online program for math to provide students with individualized practice to align to the standards. So that is for board action tonight. The third item was online two-way communication tools for board action. 
Dr. Manfrey, our Director of Secondary Education, presented two online communication schools talking points and Blackboard Reach. That again is for board action. And the fourth item was policies. Um, there are three policies um, for tonight, policy 137.1, policy 150, and policy 335. These are all for second reading. Um, a detailed summary of this um, meeting is available on board docs and also on our website. And we had no public comments. Thank you, President Brown. That concludes my summary. Thank you very much, Mrs. Mitchell. We will now have an update on the April 27, 2021 Finance and Operations Committee meeting. Mr. Phils will read the summary. A detailed summary of the meeting, including public comments, can be found on board docs. Thank you, Board President Brown. The Finance and Operations Committee meeting was held uh, April 27th at 7 p.m. Uh, there were three items for board action. Uh, the 2021-2022 proposed, proposed final budget in compliance with the Act One timeline, Mr. Rogers presented the 2021 proposed general fund budget. Uh, we were asked to consider this budget for approval at this board meeting. The final budget presentation will be on June 15th. And this will incorporate any uh, changes, so incoming funds from the state legislature or any internal changes uh, that need to be considered. Uh, this item correlates to goal one of the Upper Darby School District Com Comprehensive Plan. Uh, the second item uh, was improving indoor air quality through federal ESSER funds. This also requires board action. Uh, this comes down to using these ESSER funds, that's elementary and secondary school emergency relief funds to update, upgrade, improve our, the the HVAC, our HVAC systems throughout our school district as best we can. Uh, the administration shared its plan to improve the district's indoor air quality uh, through these various capital and non-capital projects by utilizing a portion of these ESSER funds. This also correlates to goal one of the Upper Darby School District Comprehensive Plan. Uh, there were three policies. Uh, this is item number three. There were policy changes that also require board action. Um, 004 membership 810.1 drug and alcohol testing for covered drivers 810.3 school vehicle drivers there were no public comments uh, thank you board board president brown thank you very much dr fields the instruction and curriculum report vice president curry thank you um, president brown the instructional and curriculum report has been presented to the public and I move for its adoption. Second. Thank you very much. Are there any comments from the board? I, I just had one, President Brown, just that sure. um, as, um, as we just heard, the, the Blackboard Reach tool is on, this, is on this report and I just know that you know community, community engagement is something that's incredibly important to all of us and we all know that that with our very diverse group of students who speak a very, very large number of different languages at home. I'm just so excited. I really appreciate the, the administration's work on getting us this tool so that our families are able to communicate with their teachers and with the school leadership um, in, in their native languages. I, I just think, I'm really hoping that this is gonna be a real game changer for us and, and I'm really excited and I appreciate the administration working on it. Thank you very much for the comment, Dr. Haig. Are there any other comments from the board? Um, yes, thank you, President Brown. I just also want to um, say thank you um, to the district for really considering the Summer Academy and for putting in the hard work um, for the children um, to really come in during the summer months um, in person to um, enrich and move forward for the year to come. Um, this has been such a difficult year, and I just really appreciate the time and effort that was put in um, to make this happen for the children here in the district. So thank you very much. Thank you very much for that comment. Any other comments from the board? Okay, hearing none. Ms. Buford, are there any comments from the public? There are no comments from the public. Thank you. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 
Those opposed, please signify by saying I oppose and state your name for the record. Those abstaining, please signify by saying I abstain and state your name for the record. The motion carries. The personnel report, please, Mrs. Mitchell. Thank you, President Brown. The personnel report is in the hands of each board member, and before I move for its adoption, I would just like to congratulate our retirees and wish them a safe and healthy retirement. And now I move for the adoption as stated. <laughs> Thank you. Are there any comments from the board? Hearing none, are there any comments from the public, Mrs. Buford? There are no comments from the public. Thank you. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. We need a second, Mr. Brown. I'm sorry. I'll second it. Oh, thank you. Thank you for seconding. Sorry. I'm ahead of myself. <laughs> okay. We're, oh, all those in favor now, please signify by saying aye. 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 Thank you. Those opposed, please signify by saying I oppose and state your name for the record. Those abstaining, please signify by saying I abstain and state your name for the record. The motion carries. The policy report. Mr. Desnoyers. Thank you, President Brown. Uh, um, there are a number of policies being considered. The, there is one policy uh, for the in a first reading. And I would like to say before we begin the um, uh, specifics to the policy reports that um, beginning with this meeting, um, there will be posted on board docs a uh, summary of policy changes documents, which will detail um, changes to policies and will that will explain changes to policies and why those changes are being introduced. Um, and they will be those those will be posted both for board meetings and for committee meetings. Uh, so as far as uh, the first reading, um, one policy is up for a first reading, and as a reminder, uh, since this is a first reading, no board action is required. Um, but policy 121, field trips, is up for a first reading, and um, the changes are as follows. Um, First, the office responsible for approving field trips is updated to the Office of Assistant Superintendent for Student Services, or designee. And two new uh, ARs, or administrative regulations, are getting added to this policy. First, 121 AR0, extended activity trip request. The extended activity trip request for overnight trips implements a requirement that a, a district administrator accompany overnight trips. Uh, and there's also um, 121 AR1 student field trip request form also being added to this policy. That concludes my report for the uh, first reading report. Should I move into the uh, second reading? Please do. Thank you, sir. Okay. So for the policies in second reading, the policy report is in the hands of each board member and has been made available to the public. I move for its adoption. Second. Thank you. Are there any comments from the board? Mr. Brown, I have a comment. Yes, please do, sir. Uh, so there are six policies on, on the second reading report. Uh, they are policy 004, membership, policy 137.1, .1, extracurricular participation by home education students, policy 150, Title I, comparability of services, policy 335, family and medical leaves without FFCRA attachments, Policy 810.1, drug and alcohol testing for covered drivers, and Policy 810.3, school vehicle drivers. Uh, and since the changes and their justifications were reviewed both at the uh, April committee meetings and at the April board meeting, I will not go through uh, 
the changes and their justifications, but I will say uh, the summary of changes is posted to board docs and can be accessed by the uh, public and by the board members. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Desnoves, for your comment, and thank you for being our policy chair. You do a great job with these policies. Are there any other comments from board members? Hearing none, are there any comments from the public, Ms. Buford? There are no comments from the public. Thank you. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, please signify by saying I oppose and state your name for the record. Those abstaining, please signify by saying I abstain and state your name for the record. The motion carries. The supplies report, Director War Savage. Thank you, President Brown. The supplies report is in the hands of each board member and has been made available to the public. Before I move forward for with its adoption, I just want to draw extra attention to the fact that this includes orders for over 2,000 sets of desks and over 2,000 sets of chairs, further underscoring this com community's commitment to making sure that our students return to a safe and in-person uh, learning experience possible. Would you like to move for its adoption? Of course, yes. Okay, I'll thank you. Move forward with this adoption. Oh, thank you. Is there a second? second? Thank you very much. Are there any other comments from the board? Hearing none, Ms. Buford, are there, are there any comments from the public? There are no comments from the public. Thank you. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, please signify by saying I oppose and state your name for the record. Those abstaining, please say. Please signify by saying I abstain and state your name for the record. The motion carries. Okay, the facilities report, the use of facilities report, the donation and the donation report, Mr. Fields. The facilities report, thank you, Board President Brown. The facilities report, the use of facilities report, and the donation report are in the hands of each board member uh, and, and have been made available to the public. Before I move for its adoption, I want I want to thank the companies and individuals that make donations to the school district. They are always appreciated. I move for their adoption. Thank you for your comments and thanking those companies, uh, Mr. Fields. Are there any other comments from the board? Second. Second? Thank you. Okay. No other comments from the board? Hearing none. Are there any comments from the public? Ms. Buford. There are no comments from the public. Thank you. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, please signify by saying I oppose and state your name for the record. Those abstaining, please say, please signify by saying I abstain and state your name for the record. The motion carries. Dr. Haig, the finance and budget report, please. Thank you, President Brown. The finance and budget report is in the hands of each board member and has been made available to the public. I move for its adoption. Second. Okay, thank you very much. Are there any comments from the board? Hearing none, are there any comments from the public, Ms. Buford? There are no comments from the public. Thank you. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, Please signify by saying I oppose and state your name for the record. Those abstaining, please signify by saying I abstain and state your name for the record. The motion carries. All right, we are now at the collateral assignment reports portion of our meeting. And we will start as we always do with the Delaware County Community College, Vice President Curry. Thank you, President Brown. Um, we have not met um, as a team um, pretty much this entire year, but um, <laughs> because of the COVID restrictions and just, I think, um, people not being able to with their schedules. But I do want to um, highlight the fact that um, the Delaware County Community College and so many of our community members um, do attend and so much goes on there. They um, had registration. Um, for safe, affordable education and training opportunities, both in person and online mm -hmm. for this summer and in the fall. And they have five modalities of instruction that they are going to be offering traditional classrooms, 
which are face-to-face, -face, fully on-campus instruction, hybrid, which is the blend of an on-campus and asynchronous online instruction. They have synchronous, completely online in real time, and they are offering asynchronous online, completely online with no set meeting dates and times and both. And in addition to that, they are opening up the campus um, this summer for mm -hmm. children and the summer camp programs. Um, and the kids at the Delaware County Community College will begin on June 21st. All camps will be in accordance with Pennsylvania and U.S. Centers, US Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Um, safety guidelines, including classroom size limits and masks will be required for all indoor. Um, and then the co college's kids summer camp will be held Monday through Thursday, January, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, January, June 21st through July 29th. And to register, um, they're asking to contact the college's education division at 610-359-5025 or to visit them online at dccc.edu slash summer camps. And that's all I have for that report. Thank you. Thank you very much. You came up with something even though you haven't met. Mm. Thank you for that. <laughs> all right, the Delaware County Intermediate Unit, please, Vice, uh, not uh, <laughs> Board Director Mitchell. Sorry, I apologize. Thank you, President Brown. Um, the DCIU board met on May 5th and we have another meeting tomorrow night for our committee meetings. I'm just going to give a very, very brief summary tonight. Um, we made several approvals to support professional development opportunities for the district and the IU staff. We approved um, certain supports to children and families, including a number of pre-K counts grants, early Head Start submissions, um, approval of other grants, contracts, leases, appointments for services, changing some positions around and um, some approvals to enhance student learning and the work experience um, to support future educators. Um, our next meeting, our next board meeting is on June 2nd. If you'd like to attend, um, that would be great. Um, and that concludes my report for tonight. Thank you very much, Mrs. Mitchell. Legislative Council, Mr. Neal, I think there's one tomorrow morning. I'm not going to steal your thunder, but please. Yeah, I mean, it's you. It's always like the day after our meeting. Um, <laughs> oh, it's always a, like a, um, the report from like a month ago and any happenings uh, recently. But the report I provided to the board and to the uh, listed on board docs, um, you know, when I did create that, the um, in the first subject, there were um, talkings about the vaccinations for 16 and up, and now that's changed obviously. Um, so I believe it's uh, lower now. So it's not just 16, but I believe uh, 12 and up. So um, that's really the only change that I need to make to my report. Um, and that kind of happened after I sent it. So I do apologize for that. No need to apologize. The timing is the timing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it's great news. So um, yep. yeah, I appreciate your detailed reports you. that you uh, generate from that from that meeting. So thank you. Yeah, thank you. Okay, the Mendenhall Tyson Scholarship Committee, Dr. Haig. Huh? Sure, sure, absolutely. Um, yeah, so I, I just want to bring up um, the fact that I know um, Board Member Neal talked about um, the fact that we have um, legislation that is, you know, we have our meetings usually ahead, but there is, um, uh, I just want to bring up Senate Bill 664. Um, and I feel like it's really important to bring this up um, because it's moving pretty quickly through the Senate, uh, the PA Senate right now, and um, the DCIU um, legislative meeting that we'll be attending tomorrow morning, um, they actually sent out some um, information about it. And I, I think that it's just important um, for people to look into this, especially because um, we have uh, several legislators from the area that are co-sponsors of this particular bill. And it's basically the bill um, is called the optional year of education um, due to COVID-19. And under the Senate bill uh, 664, parents could decide to have their children repeat the 2020-2021 school year because of COVID-19, the COVID-19 pandemic, school closing disruptions and virtual learning issues. In current practices, this decision on whether to hold a student back is made solely by the child's school 
and their teachers. This bill has a bipartisan support and seems to be moving pretty quickly through the Senate. And it's important, um, there are so many things that, um, that are troubling about this particular bill, but the one that, um, of course, comes to mind with a, with a mandate is that the impact to taxpayers, again, um, in examining how this would be uh, funded so that it's not another um, uh, expense to our uh, taxpayers. And so generally, um, students staying in action year are more, more, most likely the most expensive and could have serious cost impact, again, for our local taxpayers. So um, please, I'm saying this so that we can be informed in the public. If you have information that you need further, and I'm saying this to the public, um, please contact um, Senator Tim Carney, who is a sponsor of this bill and who is our uh, senator in this area in Upper Darby. Um, and that's all I have to say about it. And thank you very much. And he's on the Education Committee, so it's significant to, for people, to, the public to know that. Thank you for that information. Okay, now the uh, Mendenhall Tyson Scholarship Report, Dr. Hay. Thank you, President Brown. The Mendenhall Tyson Scholarship Committee met uh, last night, actually, yesterday. And um, we got to hear about the four recipients for this year. And, uh, you know, as always, these are amazing students who are, you know, making, making some of us feel slightly inadequate. Um, <laughs> and so I'm, I'm really excited for everyone to hear more about them at the end of the month when we, when we have our awards presentation because, you know, as always, they're, they're incredibly impressive. Thank you very much. Look forward to hearing more about them. They're always very impressive. Director War Savage, Home and School. Thank you, President Brown. Um, as far as Home and School is concerned, Dr. McGarry, uh, once again, along with Ms. Buford and the administrative team, had done a wonderful job in meeting all of our district home and school families over the last roughly four to six weeks. And I attended a vast majority of them, even outside of the schools that I'm a direct liaison for. And I can tell you um, that when we say that we are a diverse district, it certainly doesn't uh, just apply to our socioeconomic or skin deep differences. It also applies to how we think and feel. And it's a beautiful thing to see that collaboration happen in live time because considerations of people in one school district neighborhood might be different from slightly different uh, than our friends and family on the other side, but it's all the same common goal of making sure that we have as mutually beneficial and equitable of a public school experience as possible. So again, that's just to say, Dr. McGarry is always available uh, for another round of school, home and school visits. I'm sure he is really super excited for me signing him up for a whole bunch more, um, but it's really, really super important, everyone, if you're listening to this meeting or even afterwards and you're listening to the recording, please, please, please get involved with your home and school associations. Even if your kids have since graduated out of some of those schools, you're still allowed to be a member of the school district community by any means necessary. And if we can help you find that path through the home and school, which is an awesome place to start, please let us open that door for you. Thank you very much, Director War Savage. Technology, Dr. McGarry, I'm gonna put you on the spot and just ask you about Chromebooks, of course, and what the plan it for the end of the year is, is that, is that? Oh, geez, I, I, pulled a, I pulled a council. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> that was council's fault. <laughs> Go ahead. Yes, you did, Dr. McGarry. No more. <laughs> so I just wanted to ask you about the, um, the Chromebooks and the plan for the end of the year. Is it to collect them all and replenish them and redistribute them next year? Yes, we have... Uh, quite a comprehensive plan that's going to be coming out very soon we just met on monday morning today's tuesday yesterday uh for cabinet uh mr holinsky has been working on this plan we've asked him to to put a plan together the plan will begin the last week of in-person instruction we'll begin to collect chromebooks for the students that are attending in person and run until the 15th until the evening of the 15th to return chromebooks uh to get them taken care of checked up updated 
And then students that are going to be um, coming to school over the summer, we have a plan for those students to make sure they have their Chromebooks. We're also going to collect Chromebooks from seniors. So we have a very robust plan to collect them. It's really important for parents to understand, too, if you plan on, thank you for asking this, I probably should have had this in my report this evening, so you can make a note, um, that I, I, I need to remind parents that if you are planning on, you know, if you're moving for whatever the circumstances are, if your student's graduating, uh, please make it a point to return these Chromebooks to us. We need them for the other students in the school district. They're a vital part of the curriculum and the education moving forward, and they're expensive as we you know, go through our budget process. So if you withdraw from the school district, there is a process to withdraw from the school district. You actually have to fill out forms, tell us where you're going to school, unless you're graduating. And in that process, we collect resources, books, materials. Now Chromebooks are like turning in your novel or your book that you're turning in. So we do need you to, we do need to collect those resources. You'll be turning them in, the Chromebook in, from the same location where you picked it up. So if you picked up your Chromebook from one of the middle schools or the high school or the elementary school, that's where they'll be collected. We'll inventory them and we'll, and we'll go from there. So we do have a plan. It'll be coming out very soon and we'll be uh, putting it out uh, from my office uh, to the public. Thank you for your question. Thank you very much. See, you came up with it right on, right on the spot. PSBA representatives, um, Mr. Desnoyers and Mr. War Savage, I'm just going to uh, share some information first before I turn it over to you guys. Uh, there's a PA, PSBA weekly buzz that's every Tuesday, and Vice President Curry and I always attend, and uh, they put out some information for some meetings coming up, and I'll just talk about those real quickly. There's an all-school directors monthly exchange, uh, and there's two of them. There's one on 520 from 12.30 p.m. to 1.30 p.m., and another on June 17th at the same time, 12.30 to 1.30. And then there's a charter reform virtual rally on May 25th from 9.30 a.m. to 10.30 a.m. So now with that said, uh, is, is there anything PSBA related, uh, Mr. Desnoyers or Mr. War Savage? Uh, yes, President Brown, real quick. Uh, this is Director War Savage. Yes. Um, uh, one of our uh, very own directors, uh, Director uh, Rachel Mitchell, was recently featured in a PSBA publication uh, that covers her professional and educational credentials. It was, it was very widely praised, and I can speak on firsthand experience just dealing with our PSBA representative. As soon as I said, you know what, I am director so-and-so, I work with Rachel Mitchell. As soon as I said Rachel Mitchell, Karen's her name. Karen says, oh, everyone knows Rachel. Everyone loves Rachel. And I want to specifically mention that because it's really important that as elected officials, not only are we responsible for responsibly legislating, we also have to create positive relationships with stakeholders who help us make those important decisions and who provide us the wisdom, skill sets, resources to do that. And Rachel has been doing that for so long as a community member and as a board member, and I just want to draw special attention to that. So Rachel, kudos. Oh, thank you, Damian. That was very sweet. It was my honor to participate and um, showcase really our school district in the PSBA bulletin. Very well said, Mr. War Savage, and thank you, Rachel, for all your advocacy. Any other PSBA-related comments? Um, President Brown. Yes. This is Mr. Desnoyers. Um, I did participate in the, um, the PSBA monthly exchange for April, okay. um, but I have to apologize. I did not take notes, and at this point it's been a few weeks. Um, so I'm, I, uh, I don't recall the, the specifics of what was covered. Um, You're so honest. I will, I will, <laughs> I will make sure that when I participate in this month's and June's, I take notes so I'm able to report on them. Okay, Mr. Desnoyers, I'm going to hold you to that since you're so honest. No, thank you for that. Thanks. Okay. Um, policy liaisons, Mr. Desnoyers again, or Mr. Neal? Anything policy related, gentlemen? I, I did mention this under the uh, the f for first reading report, but um, uh, we will the the district will now going forward um, po post uh, what are called summary of policy change mm -hmm. documents, which will detail um, why a uh, policy is changing and give an explanation of the change. Uh, those will be posted to board docs for both uh, monthly board meetings, like tonight's meeting, and monthly uh, committee meetings. 
Thank you. I think the public will definitely appreciate that. Thank you for doing that. Any other policy-related comments? Okay. None for me, uh, President Brown. Thank you, Mr. Neal. Communication, Mrs. Mitchell or Dr. Haig. Thanks, President Brown. Uh, we do anticipate sending out the regular monthly report um, at the end of this week, and, and as always, really appreciate uh, Ms. Buford's hard work on it. Um, we hope that the public is... So I know that we, we, we sort of, in a way, we have to bridge this gap where sometimes I think people feel inundated with messages from the school and then other people feel like they, they're having trouble keeping up. And we, I really hope that our, our monthly summaries are sort of hitting the highlights and helping to sort of focus people's attention on, on some of the critical issues because I know at least that's, that's sort of my goal with it. And so we, we hope people enjoy them and uh, we'll keep doing them. Thank you very much for doing that. Look forward to the next one. Okay, I think that moves us along to old business. And at least the one item under old business is the phase school reopening health and safety plan. Be it resolved that the Board of School Directors approve the district phase school reopening health and safety plan as required by the Pennsylvania Direct Department of Education, I move for its adoption. Second. Thank you. Are there any comments from the board? Director Desnoyers has a comment. Okay, thank you. Please uh, go. Pre President Brown, yes. Um, I just wanted to, to um, double check. My understanding um, was that when the, um, when the board adopted the most recent version of the health and safety plan, uh, I want to say back in the fall, maybe October, November, um, the administration was given the um, the authority, I'll say, to make decisions about returning students to school. And so would you mind just reviewing what is changing in this plan? Great question. I'll allow Dr. McGarry to answer that, please. Mr. Desnoyers, thank you so much for, for, for bringing that up and pointing that out. And uh, I agree. You know, I, I have the responsibility and the ability to open schools and to interpret the latest changes. In this particular situation, there are some changes regarding the masking. And it does change a little bit of our previous health plan that we had in place. So I felt that it was appropriate to bring that to the board as far as masking during the recess time and not just simply make that decision on my own. Um, I probably could have. Uh, moved in that direction, but I did feel it best to bring this up under old business because it was a masking change. The health plan that we currently had uh, listed with each one of the areas had masking as a requirement at all times, and this update provides some relief of masking while at recess. So I wanted to make sure uh, that I brought that to the attention of the board and make sure that the board's aware of that, that we're moving in that direction. The board could also say, you know what, wait till next year, but I felt that our recommendation would impl be implement, implement that now, but encourage masking in other times. Thank you very much for that clarification. And thank you for your question, Mrs. Desnoyers. Any other questions from the board? Director Fields has a question. Yes, Mr. Fields. Thank you, Board President Brown. Um, page 22 of this, uh, uh, of this document, um, I, I, I want clarification on face coverings. Uh, the term face coverings is used throughout the document. It's defined as masks and or face shields. Um, uh, what is the district uh, requesting that, that is used when people, uh, that people use, students and teachers? Hi, Mr. Fields. This is uh, Ed Marshalek. So the, the, the face shields and the face masks in the document is a stock, you know, uh, column that's in that we can't alter. Uh, when you look at the links in the actual document, it does reflect that masks are the preferred uh, face covering per the governor's order and only face shields will only be worn when and if a face mask cannot be worn for any reason whether it be disability or any other type of uh, um, uh, issue that might prevent someone from wearing a mask so our district uh, preference and policy per this not policy but, but procedure per this uh, health and safety plan is to wear a face mask at all times with the exception of what's being proposed tonight for outdoor physical activity. Okay. I really appreciate that clarification. Thank you very much. 
Okay, next question from board members. Is it uh, Vice President Kerry? Okay. Yes, thank you, um, Board President Brown. I just have a clarif clarification question um, concerning um, the face mask. Um, so, Dr. McGarry, I just wanted to ask, um, when would this be going into, for the public, going into effect um, for students who are actually um, in the building and would be participating in recess? We would be implementing this if the board took action on this evening starting tomorrow, correct, Mr. Marshalek? <clears throat> yes, that's correct. Okay, and another question um, regarding that. So for parents who are on the line and listening right now, if they're uncomfortable with their child being on the playground without a mask, what would your um, what, would you just clarify what the regulations would be? Yeah, as, as I uh, went through in the short-term and long-term goal part of the presentation tonight for my report, I, I would again agree, and I appreciate bringing it up. We, we would still like to see students keep their mask on on the playgrounds and outside. We recognize that as it gets warmer toward the end of the school year that kids getting outside, getting physical activity. Now, right now at our elementary schools, uh, interestingly enough, there aren't many students that are out for recess given the half-day programming anyway. Um, it's more so, I think, that comes into play for like some of the outside sports activities where students would be unmasked uh, and our low incident special education programs, which masking has already been a situation where we're working with students on that. But at the elementary schools right now, we don't have recess taking place because we're in a half-day program. This change really impacts some of the out outdoor athletic competitions. And again, for me, it's a little bit of a head-scratcher at times. You know, we're allowed to wear, not wear a mask during some of these physical activities, but as far as getting the schools back in, you have to wear the mask, you have to have certain social distancing. So it's interesting to keep the masks off when you can play lacrosse or tackle football. Um, in other ways, it might not be in place, but we're following the guidance. I think it has a lot to do with the weather as well changing. Um, but we would encourage parents that if their kids are able to keep their mask on, if they're not running around there too hot while outdoors in school, we would still encourage wearing a mask. So would this be um, in play for the summer programs as well? Because, you know, thinking about it right now, um, if we move this forward and then the possibility of students coming back in after June 1, um, just, you know, making sure that everybody is clear on what this looks like. Because personally, um, I feel like, you know, a lot of people have said with, with getting children back in, they'll see children in the community, you know, riding around their bikes and things like that without masks. And those were some of the concerns early on. Um, just wanna, you know, make sure that that's a, a point of clarification, particularly because the children, if they come back in and then they are coming back in the building, then they're asked to put their mask on. And there's just, you know, I know as we're trying to move forward and get back to some normalcy, um, that these are things that we're going to have to consider, but I just want to help the public and parents to feel comfortable um, about these mandates. No, thank you very much. And, and we, we could probably follow up too with some public communication regarding like feeling comfortable. We obviously want to create a safe atmosphere for kids. So regarding your question uh, throughout the summer, you know, we're still kind of in limbo as far as the changing guidance on masking indoors if you're vaccinated or if you're not, and what does that look like? We do know there's a lot of conversation with younger students, especially elementary age students, that if, if the adults are vaccinated and they're two weeks beyond that, um, they're, in a, they're in a much better situation the adults. As far as students are concerned, and, and I know a, a board member will remind me of this, our students have told us that their biggest concern is going home and bringing it home to elderly or grandparents or family members that are sick. So we would encourage families and students that, you know, it's okay and it's still safe to wear a mask. We would encourage that still while in the building, we'll still be requiring a mask of students. Um, and again, this really has to do with physical exertion, being outside playing and not wearing a mask. But while you're coming to school for in-person instruction, regardless of the social distancing right now, and until that changes, we would be requiring a mask of students while they're attending our schools. Um, and that's still a factor in our health and safety plan. We don't know, Ms. Curry, to your point, what the future holds with that because there seems to be ever-changing changing guidance. But at this point in time, we're going to encourage our parents and our students to wear, wear and when possible. This, this is not relieving you of wearing a mask outside completely. It's more about physical activity and sweating and, and, and you know, getting kids out there again. And uh, that, that's a time when you can take your mask off when you're outside. So we'll, we'll encourage that and remind parents about still putting best protocols in place as we, as we work through the summer. Thank you, Dr. McCary. 
thank you for that. Any other questions from board members? Okay, hearing none, Ms. Buford, are there any comments from the public? There are no comments from the public. Okay. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, please signify by saying I oppose and state your name for the record. I oppose Gina Curry. Okay. Those abstaining, please signify by saying I abstain and state your name for the record. The motion carries. Is there any other old business from board members? Okay, hearing none, we'll move on to new business from board members. Okay, hearing none. We are now at the time for the public hearing. We will read both emailed and phone comments, which are subject to the three minute time limit and must include the commenter's name and address. Mrs. Buford. President Brown, there are no comments from the public this evening. Thank you very much. Is there a motion for the adjournment of the meeting? So moved. moved. Second, David Neal. Thank you very much. All in favor? Aye. 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 Meeting adjourned. Have a great night and thank you for your patience.